Hey everyone, back again. Today, we're continuing on the moral philosophy train, which will end this week, with John Stuart Mill's Utilitarianism, which, great book. If you haven't read it, you know, it's one of the, it's, it's part of the canon, you know, it's good, good to go and read. Uh, but before jumping into it, hi, I'm David. If you're new here, I explain philosophical concepts and ideas and ways to make them accessible to you. So if you're new, you can like, share, subscribe. If you found this as a podcast, you're going to be able to find me on YouTube as well, where sometimes there are videos. Isn't that fun? Or if you found this on YouTube, you're also going to be able to find it under all the same names as a podcast if you prefer to just listen. And, you know, you can tell your friends, too. Apparently, I have a soothing voice. Maybe I can help you fall asleep at night if that is not a creepy thing to say. If you want to follow me on any other platforms, you can find me on Instagram and TikTok and X, even though I don't use that abominable site. Uh, you can help me out monetarily via Patreon or PayPal, but no pressure to do that. The best way to help is just tell your friends. Who knows? They might love it. So yeah, let's jump into John Stuart Mill's Utilitarianism, which I'm hoping to cover in one episode. Might be a little longer than some of the other ones I've done, but in any case, I hope that you're able to uh, stay focused for the whole thing. So let's jump into chapter one, titled General Remarks. Now, what he's going to do throughout this entire text is find a justification for a certain kind of moral philosophy that isn't predicated upon appealing to, like, God, to say, like, oh, we should act in X, Y, Z ways because God says so, or because of some other universal principle. Instead, he wants to offer a way by which to organize society and to think about morality, justice, and like I said, how to organize society based off of what people all want, and that is to feel good, to be happy. So his guiding question throughout this text is, how can we maximize people's happiness, not only on an individual level, but among as many people as possible? And that, for him, should be the driving force behind any efforts to organize ourselves morally, or socially, or culturally, or whatever. Now, as far as the actual substance of what he's saying in this chapter, he starts out by saying that philosophy has historically been haunted by the question of good and evil. It seems as though we've been at a standstill since Socrates, though, in his appeal to a utilitarianism against the popularity of the so-called sophist. Now, if you read Socrates' work, specifically, Socrates didn't write anything, sorry. If you read The Republic, for example, in which Plato lays out Socrates' words about setting up this perfect society that Socrates imagines, he says very clearly that the end goal is to maximize the happiness of everybody. Now, the thing is, for Socrates, is that He's imagining a world that's very hierarchically organized. It's highly hierarchically organized. Where in Socrates' idea about a perfect world, he offers us three broad groups of people. He says there are the philosopher kings that are going to guide that society. There are guardians, like military people, who will protect that society. And then there's everyone else. Workers, artisans, whatever. And... He just flat out says, this social arrangement is the best kind because it'll maximize everyone's happiness, even if some people are really going to suffer. And John Stuart Mill sees this or hears this and he's like, okay, we're, we're on to something here. But is there a way to do away with maybe some of the bad parts of that? That is the implication that there must be people who suffer. John Stuart Mill wants to imagine an opportunity to take Socrates' idea about maximizing everybody's happiness without necessarily reducing some people to a state of just indentured servitude where they just have to work their whole lives and not actually attain uh, you know, any real lasting happiness or self-determinacy in their lives. So Mill distinguishes the construction of any kind of moral law that is based on good and evil from the construction and practice of a science. So unlike moral law and its legislation, science extracts a general theory 
from particular instances and events. Now, by contrast, in Mill's words, all rules of action are determined by the end to which they are subservient. And here I think it's important to unpack what he means by this. He's essentially saying that the ends justify the means. Where for Mill, he's thinking about happiness as the ultimate utility. That is, for him, everyone is guided by a desire to make themselves happy. That is what is the most useful to what it means to be human for Mill. And so, no matter what or how we do that, the end goal of happiness is the most important thing. So it doesn't matter how we get there as long as we get there. And there are some problems about this. There's, there's some fundamental problems here. You know, you go into a whole thing about the problem with associating or privileging the ends to the means. We could just look at Kant for that, but I'm not going to bore you with that. Uh, if you want more on that, I've covered Kant's groundwork of the metaphysics of morals and his second critique, the critique of practical reason. If you want more on that, you can go and re listen to those episodes if you want. But there's also an, like a really great story by, Ur by Ursula K. Le Guin, just to say the story very, very briefly, because it's a short story. It's like five pages long. Ursula K. Le Guin uh, lays out or illustrates a perfect society, absolutely perfect in every single way, except she reveals at the end that its perfection is dependent upon a single child suffering immeasurably all day, all night for their whole life. And the question is, who is actually willing to live a perfect life if it means that somebody else is suffering? So it, it's like a perfect world. It absolutely encapsulates exactly what Mill is talking about. That is, the ends seem to justify the means. Everybody's happiness is probably, at least in this story as it's being conveyed, is probably a better situation than releasing the boy who's suffering or the child who's suffering and letting them be free and have everyone else live a miserable life, including that child themselves. And it's something that everybody must confront, especially for anyone living in the West, like currently I'm in the US, but for example, many of the luxuries that people in the global North and West are actually able to acquire for relatively cheaply is because it's acquired by nearly enslaved labor overseas in India, Bangladesh, Western China, for example. And so we must ask, like, even though our happiness has ostensibly, bear with me, just been attained, it has come about only by exploiting others. But for Mill, it seems as though that's okay. But, you know, we have to really interrogate whether or not we're okay with that. So for him, the ends justify the means, which I, I personally don't agree with, but this is what, this is his idea. Now, up to Mill, or according to Mill, moral philosophers can be largely divided into two groups. There are those who believe in humanity's possession of a biological sense of right and wrong. So we're just born knowing what's right and what's wrong. And then there are people who don't believe in such a universal faculty, like we're born with the ability to tell right from wrong, but who think that we can discover a common groundwork for moral judgment through experience. So Mill is here identifying two camps of thought. You have one group of people who are like, we have the innate capacity to tell right from wrong. We have a, an innate sense of what justice is. And then you have another group of people who say, no, but perhaps we can find that truth if we just collate and bring together enough people's experiences to discover what justice, what right and wrong really are. And while Mill, would, I think, would certainly lean towards the second option, he sees a problem with both of these perspectives. And that is for him that both of these perspectives believe that there is this thing out there called justice or knowledge of right and wrong that we can somehow unearth, which he's not so sure about. He doesn't think 
that any kind of idea of justice or knowing about right and wrong can be so neatly just discovered out there in nature. And he adds that there is a fundamental irony here in that both of these camps of thought often just skirt around or ignore happiness. They are often disinterested in questions of happiness or bodily satisfaction, enjoyment, things that philosophers, and I'm being very general here, philosophers in the Western tradition have historically excluded in favor of trying to find these pure truths out there. They aren't interested in like people's happiness because they're like, oh, that's subjective. You know, some, per some person might like jazz music while someone else might not, someone like might like tomatoes, someone else might not, you know, there's nothing to learn from that. Whereas Mill is looking exactly at this thing that legacies of philosophers, leagues of philosophers before him largely ignored or thought was like, you know, useless pursuit. Why do we gotta, why do we have to look at happiness? Mill is like, no, this is the key to determining like how to best organize our world not by appealing to some abstract idea about justice or right and wrong. We just have to look at what makes us happy. Now of all the perspectives, all the philosophers before him that he's implying fall into the one, one or two of these camps that he disagrees with, his primary enemy is Immanuel Kant. And specifically, he goes after Immanuel Kant's idea of the categorical imperative. And the categorical imperative, for those who don't know, just briefly goes like this. The categorical imperative suggests that one must act or one should act in such a way that their act could be a universal law. So the way I like to think about this is like, <laughs> let's say you go and get a morning coffee or something. You go into like a, a bakery or, or a cafe or something. You go in and you feel like asking the person at the counter, asking them about every single food option they have uh, listed probably on some chalkboard behind them or, or something. And in that moment, you know, it's a moment, it's actually many minutes, there's a line of people, people accumulating behind that first person who wants all of this information. And in that moment, we can certainly surmise that that first person is not acting properly. The reason they're not, act, according to Kant, the reason they're not acting properly is because if everybody did that, then no one would be able to eat. Everybody would then have to ask about each food item. So in that case, doing that thing cannot be part of a categorical imperative or cannot meet that criteria or any of the criteria for the categorical imperative because it cannot be construed, it cannot be taken as a universal law or universal kind of action in the world. So the categorical imperative implies that there is a possible universal principle that we can acquire, even though Kant never says like, here are the rules. Instead, he gives us a method by which to maybe act in such a way as to approximate something resembling a universal truth of moral judgment of being a moral person in the world. And that is to adhere with a possible universal law. And you just ask yourself, like, would everybody do the same thing in the same circumstance? And Mill hates this. Mill is like, okay, dude, but if you're living in a world where like Nazism is okay, the universal principle should never be followed, even though it's likely what everybody is following. He doesn't use that term. He came before Nazism. Uh, but like, we can apply it to that setting to understand the limits of Kant's idea. Now, okay, if there's a Kantian among you, it's like, oh, that wouldn't work because you're just describing some specific instance in some country somewhere, a few different countries. Like, this isn't universal. Bear with me. Just imagine a world that has been subsumed by Nazism. Obviously, a horrible, horrible nightmare or like a dystopian 1984 type thing, whatever. Like just imagine something like that in which the universal laws have been dictated by violence, by prejudice, discrimination, and so on, like horrendous stuff, okay? 
So Mill is like, this is bad. Like this is not a good template to actually understand or approach moral philosophy and moral law. Now, in contrast to this, Mill suggests that we need utilitarianism, specifically the like moral philosophy that emphasizes what people need, what makes them happy and what allows them to exist in the world. And that puts us here into chapter two, what utilitarian is or what is utilitarianism? What utilitarianism is, what is utilitarianism, whatever. So there are two large misconceptions about uh, the theory of utility or about utilitarianism. Now these two large misconceptions, the first goes that it isn't concerned with pleasures, but only use values. So things that are useful in the world. So it, we know from Adam Smith, you know, the wealth of nations, really the one of the first thinkers of, uh, first political economists, people to think about the economy, the capitalist economy. Uh, he says there, he lays out the distinction between use values and exchange values, where a use value is a thing that you can use in the world, like a shovel, whereas an exchange value doesn't have a use, its only value is in its ability to be exchanged, like money. So paper money has no use besides being exchanged. Maybe you could like, you could burn paper money if you needed to make fire, uh, but bear with me in accepting that that's not its primary use. It exists as exchange value. So let me reiterate, the first misconception of utilitarianism is that it is not concerned with pleasures, but only use values. So Mill is like, no, 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 it is concerned with pleasures. And the second misconception is that it makes moral law question purely of pleasure and happiness. So he's like, it's not that utilitarian of, utilitarianism is ignoring pleasure, nor is it hyper-emphasizing it. it. There's more to it than that. It's more nuanced than that. So what is it then? Mill tells us that utility, or the greatest happiness principle, simply suggests that actions are right in proportion as they tend to produce happiness and wrong as they tend to produce the reverse of happiness, where here happiness refers to pleasures and the absence of pain and unhappiness refers to pain and the privation of pleasure or the absence of pleasure. Now, just bear with him. Obviously, this is very vague right now, and this is he's deliberately doing this. What this tells us, though, is that pleasure and freedom from pain are the only desirable things as ends in themselves. So apparently for him, people only like pleasure is one of the only things that people pursue because it is good in itself. And we find the same thing from Aristotle, too. And I think that he's I, you know, I'm not totally aware of Mill's, you know, understanding of the Greeks. Uh, we find like a similar argument in Aristotle when Aristotle tries to justify like humanity's attachment to reason uh, by going through emotions first, where Aristotle says something along the lines of like, we experience pleasure for itself. So that moves us beyond just being like purely evolutionary beings. Because if we were just like products of our environment, evolutionary beings, we would be very content with just the absolute bare minimum. But as humans, like, you don't just eat for the sake of staying alive, like, it, unless you need to. Humans will eat things that they prefer, or, or you know, will play sports that they prefer, or what, do other things that they prefer, or, you know, sleep in positions as comfortable for them, whatever. Like, maybe this can all be chalked up to evolution, but Aristotle thought it was evidence that maybe Maybe there's something more than us just having emerged from the soil. Okay, so if you've been listening, you might say, wait, David, but the Mill is just talking about what makes people feel good. I mean, that just debases what it means to be a human, doesn't it? If, if all he's saying is what makes us human or what sets up any moral philosophy is our ability to feel good, to eat things that we like or 
to sleep in ways that we like, like whatever. Doesn't that, what really sets us apart from animals? And Mill is clear or presents that this has been a, this is a common counter argument against utilitarianism, where it doesn't really offer anything other than saying that, yeah, we're humans, which are just animals, and we just do things that feel good. And that's it. Where Mill is like, actually, no, there's, there's evidence here of something more. And against these ideas, Mill says that there are uh, they are the ones to reduce happiness and pleasure to animal pleasure when we actually have elevated our faculties and our tastes. So Mill's idea here isn't reducible to just like bodily satisfactions to keep us alive. He's describing like how I said about Aristotle, he's describing like taste. He's describing human interest in things that are beyond just satisfying basic needs. Now, obviously, there's a ton of privilege associated with this. We have to ask, like, th who is this reserved for? You know, when currently in the world, a, d a deplorable percentage of the world's population has no access to water, not to mention war, famine, poverty. The, there are just so many people who do not have this privilege. And as soon as, you know, we add that little detail and we aren't just living in, you know, upper class English life where all we see is prosperity, I think that it, it it's harder to jive with Mill's ideas because it seems like he's disavowing the possibility that not everyone is just living their life trying to pursue their taste in the way that he wants. And therefore, how can we actually extract from that some universal idea about what happiness is, or about what makes us human, or about justice. Now, as though primarily to prove my point, he says that he would rather be, he would rather be uh, a dissatisfied human than a satisfied pig. And that is because he always wants to keep his eye on the pleasure of the higher faculties. He's not reducing humans to just like bodily drives or bodily pleasures. He's thinking about pleasure, he's thinking about feeling good, he's thinking about happiness, but on a, you know, a higher level. And there's a way for him, he thinks, to quantify this. You know, you just offer two, you offer people two different options, whether they'd like to go to the beach or have a slice of cake, and you tally up all the results and then you find out which one will produce the greatest happiness. Who seems to want to do more uh, than the other? Now, like, of course, problems, right? Problems, but you, you know what that is. Uh, and he, he says, he's like, I would rather be a Socrates than a fool who experiences endless like bodily pleasures. And he's contributing to, or he's jumping on, he belongs to the historical trajectory of privileging the mind over the body, saying that, you know, the mind is something that gives people this opportunity to elevate themselves, whereas the body is just what makes all, all humans just the same and uh, the same as animals and therefore nothing valuable is really to be had there or found there. Now, according to him, advanced creatures and humans naturally prefer to appease their the, these higher order desires than basic bodily or animal ones. So it like, you get it. I, do, I mean, I don't think I have to keep hammering you with the issues with this. Obviously, this serves as a justification for racism, colonialism. Many of these ideas were echoed by supporters of colonialism to say that indigenous peoples all across the planet were not at Europe, the level of Europeans cognitively and that therefore they were not, they didn't have a right to their land or their traditions or themselves and they could be exploited. They could be sold into enslavement because they were less than human which, you know, because here he's essentially defining what it means to be human by, a, you know, attaining a certain level of mental prowess or proficiency without ever interrogating what that means, what that means. Does that mean just like learning about European history and able to do European types of math and science and astronomy? Like, is, are these markers of intelligence or are they just markers of European education system? 
which are not the same things. So he's clear that people only prefer, prefer, prefer these lower pleasures when they lose the ability to appreciate intellectual taste because of outside influences. But this is all still very individual. Whereas utilitarianism refers to the general good and therefore the generalization of higher pleasure faculties. The more people experience it, the better it is for everyone. Which I mean, I'm, uh, yeah, it sounds about right. So does he say here that there should be free education for all? For women, children, adults, like, of course he doesn't, right? You know, the, it's like, we can take this to the next step then, uh, but he doesn't say that, but in any case. Now, of course, by pleasure and happiness, he's not referring to momentary feeling but lasting satisfaction. He's not interested in just like feeling good for one moment. Utilitarianism is interested in the general good and a general good that is sustained. And for him, because the quote unquote civilized world offers so much happiness, any rightly brought up human should be able to take advantage, uh, like <laughs> they can be content, even if they aren't the richest or the most successful. And this is something that's been repeated, John Locke and Adam Smith and yada, yada, yada. People who are like, it's better to be a poor person suffering in capitalism than a rich person in another part of the world, which is wrong, <laughs> They're wrong in every way. But it's, it's a European myth that's meant to convey European superiority, that it's better than every other part of the world no matter how much people are suffering in Europe. But these people writing in the you know, 17th, 18th centuries, they weren't traveling to like what is now Uganda or actually seeing how people lived, for example, or to China or to South America to actually talk with people. All they were doing was taking accounts or even stories written about these people by other Europeans and then extracting some universal understanding about them, which yeah, you get it. Now, part of the project, and I certainly agree with him, he's like, there's no reason that we have like poverty on such a rampant scale, even at the time when he's talking about it. The amount of wealth there is, there's no reason that there's poverty in the way that there is. We have the means, he was writing this in the 17th, 18th century, we have the means to create houses for everyone. And we do still to this day. Like, you know, the myth that there's a housing crisis. It's like, no, we have, we, we, we have the infrastructure for it. It's just that so many buildings are sitting empty or buildings are being converted into one family houses that would otherwise have held like many apartments for people. But, you know, nobody wants to have that conversation. Uh, but he's like, part of the duty of utilitarianism is not to just provide people a template to then pursue their own individual happiness. This has to be a collective effort. Because it is best for everybody if everybody's happy. And I think that there's so, there's so much truth to that. Because the more people you then have being happy, having their basic needs met, able to participate in culture and society, are going to be able to contribute to art, science, math, anything, which will make society better. Don't you want more people participating in these things? And doing so because they want to, not because they need to, to make money or to like make ends meet to just be able to survive. Scarcity, like capitalism tells us this myth that like scarcity is the mother of invention or like people need to suffer and they'll, they'll create new things to improve their situation and it encourages ingenuity and whatever. Like these are all like, these are myths that we constantly are told when historically it's been, at least the people we read because of our history books, have been people who've been well off, like vast majority of the time. And they were very much capable of creating new things, of contributing to society and culture. Wouldn't it just make more sense to have more people being able to do that? I think so. I think Mill thinks, though, as well, thinks so as well. Now, there's going to be certain situations he's clear about where people are going to sacrifice themselves for the greater good. And he's clear that that's not a good in itself because the person sacrifices themselves and they're dead. Uh, so that's not good. But 
he says that maybe there's going to be situations in which that's the case. And historically, there have been where people have given themselves over for a greater good. But he doesn't really want to lionize that or celebrate it because he thinks that that's, you know, we, we can find better solutions. Like, we don't need people to suffer for the greater good, especially when we have all these resources, like, right at our disposal that we're just refusing to access. Refusing to access. Imagine, yeah. Not refusing to access, but that are being held by these greedy dragons with these pots of gold, keeping people from having these resources or having access to it. Like how there's infinite money, it seems, to send uh, warplanes, bombs, other military equipment, and like money overseas, like in the U.S., but there's no money for health care, very little money for health care, very little money to actually make higher education affordable, very little money to build affordable housing. You know, we just see our priorities on display in those ways. Like what things is there infinite money for and what things is there not? Okay, so what is the duty of legislation then, given everything we've looked at so far? In his words, law and social arrangements should, number one, they should make individual happiness nearly identical with the interest of the whole. So to be happy is aligned in such a way or written to law in such a way as to align with the interests of the whole and vice versa. And secondly, to teach that happiness of the whole is equal to individual happiness. And this is like the golden rule, you know, do unto others as they would have done unto you. That the progress of the whole is a way to permit the progress or to really encourage and cultivate the progress of the individual towards their own happiness. Because the more people you have that are happy, the more people that can work together and working together is a lot better than working alone. However, people shouldn't think whether their actions are good for society before performing them, just if they're good for themselves or uh, so long as they don't infringe upon others. Now, obviously, utilitarians are more concerned with rights uh, and ends than with means. Doesn't matter how we get there as long as we have attained the greater good and happiness. But aren't all ethical and moral systems like concerned about this before utilitarianism? Like, I mean, they kind of all were. When Socrates is like laying out his perfect state, he's, you know, he's setting up this very hierarchical state, but he, he just says it'll be better than everything we've had before. Doesn't matter how we get there. There might be suffering. People might suffer on the way there. But we will arrive at this, this best system eventually. The difference is the specific kind of end. The one that Mill sets forth being the greatest general happiness. It has to be the one and only end. There can't be other things attached to it. So laws should work then to temper people's only looking after themselves. To temper, to stop them being selfish. Unless their selfishness will contribute to the whole, which is an oxymoron, you know, then they aren't being selfish. But, like he said, to set up laws in such a way that will best permit people to, like, find their happiness in ways that will privilege and benefit the whole. Now, to the charge that people don't have time to consider the consequences of their actions, like, they're, you know, in a moment of spontaneity or whatever, on, uh, or, like, think about their actions in terms of its effect on the general good, Mill says that the same is true of those claiming, like, Christian morals, for example. Not everyone has time to see themselves with, like, or to fit themselves with biblical precepts before performing an act like very few there are so many situations where people even if they are you know he's writing this many centuries ago but there are so many situations in which people are not going to have the time to consult scripture to say like oh my god am i working according to god's will here in the christian tradition so he uses that example just to be like yeah this is he's not proposing that utilitarianism is just like one day going to fix all the world's problems. It's going to encounter its own difficulties, but it has a clear objective in mind that it could work towards. So we have the entire history of, of humanity teaching what things are, like, are good and bad that we've learned from, 
Like, for example, murder. Murder's bad. I think we can all agree. And I'm sure you can think of many other things that are bad, that we just know are bad. Like sexual assault, for example, bad. Absolutely, we know, 100% not good. Very bad. So Mill thinks we, you know, in this journey towards setting up the greatest good for everybody, we have to be prepared to evaluate and reevaluate our laws to best adapt to changing circumstances because we learn things as we grow. The more people we have involved as are added into the mix of the greatest general happiness, then the more knowledge we will accrue about what is right and wrong. Like this is one of the things that came out of the Me Too movement, uh, among other things, is really demonstrating how common sexual assault in the workplace is and like why it is so important to tackle that, why it is so important for employers to have uh, safety guards in, in implemented and various other policies to deal with these things, which is good because we want, we should want women to feel safe to contribute to their world, not to be subject to harassment and assault. And that puts us here into chapter three of the ultimate sanction of the principle of utility. So how do we make sense of laws and sanctions, that is like punishments, for people who disobey the rules or disobey the laws or break the laws? Now there are two kinds of sanctions. There's external and internal. External sanctions refer to judgment and sanction from others or from God. So I'm being judged by a judge or God or whatever. And internal refers to our own bad feeling for acting improperly or selfishly. Now, some people might criticize this and say like, oh, well, you know, you don't know if God exists. or you don't know if the actual force of external judgment can, uh, you know, shape people to act a certain way or that people who do horrible things actually feel guilty about it. But, you know, all that Mill says is that he's offered nothing really radical so far because all moral systems would probably agree with what he said so far. He's just distilling all other moral systems and being like, really, we're just moving towards the primary goal, which the other moral systems have lost sight of because they're trying to find these abstract truths about justice, the nature of right and wrong, yada, yada, yada. Mill is just distilling them all into their basic core idea that we want everyone to be happy as, and to correspond to the greatest general happiness and do it in a way as to minimize suffering. And that is because people would rather be in a situation where they feel safe and they're cooperating with others and not in a state of permanent perpetual competition with others, which is like, I, I just feel like it's so much a part of American society. Like you have to be you know, stranger danger, lock your door. You have to be suspicious of everyone. You see someone wearing a, uh, a hoodie is like, be careful. You, know, you never know. Like what Richard Hofstadter calls the American style of American politics, the American, the paranoid style of American politics. Like it's almost baked into the American dream. And it's, you know, it's largely inspired by Locke too, that you're supposed to just be like, hyper worried about everybody. Everyone's out to get you. They're, they're going to take your stuff. When like, I think people actually want to be nice to others. And like we, we have movies and television and we tell each other these tales about these we have true crime podcasts to continually remind us to be scared, to be scared of everyone when I don't think it has to be that way. You can smile at people in the street too, you know? So in all of this education's role is to teach children to equate, like how to equate their own happiness with the happiness of the whole. And that puts us here into chapter four of what sort of proof the principle of utility is susceptible. So happiness is the ultimate end for Mill, but is it the only end in itself? Some might say that virtue is an end in itself, like Aristotle, for example, but it is too rare to extract a general principle from because like, for Aristotle, virtue is found in this perfect balance between all of your emotions and desires and drives. And you can't have too much money, but you can't have too little money. You know, you got to find that sweet spot right in the middle. It's very specific. You can't really, you can't really say that everyone's going to attain it, let alone if anyone has been able to attain it at all. 
So really though, for utilitarians, any time that virtue is celebrated in itself, it is really happiness that is celebrated because that's what it comes down to for Aristotle. If you read it, like it just seems like he's, he, he offers a very complicated way to arrive at happiness. Like what is it that makes people happy? Okay, but then couldn't the same be said about money or power? Like is Mill just giving us like a template to be like, just do whatever you want, just feel happy. You, you know, your immediate impulse should be like, no, because it's about the greatest general happiness. But he has to do some work to dissuade us from just thinking like, oh, I'll just get rich and <laughs> I've satisfied my purpose in the world because I'm happy. So while Mill is a little sympathetic to people who find happiness and money and power in themselves, like sees them as ends in themselves, he is clear that too much of either results in injury to others. As for the will, as for one's will, Mill is clear that in youth, will and desire go hand in hand. They can separate though. For example, we might will to do pain to ourselves or others, or we might will to do a virtuous act that will cause us pain, but we will do it for the greater good. The will should be taught and trained to essentially comply with the general happiness. And this comes about through education and through laws, how society is organized. And that puts us here to chapter five on the connection between justice and utility. So he begins with the following question. Is the sense of justice inherent in us like sight or taste for those who, who cannot see or any anything else like any of our senses? or is it produced by other external factors? To answer this, he begins by exploring whether anything universal can be observed in a believed just or unjust act. So for example, people often say it is unjust to take someone's property by breaking the law. But Mill asks, what if that law was unjust that made it so that you cannot take someone else's property? So he considers the following universal or widely held beliefs that it is unjust to deprive someone of their liberty and their property. This is coming from John Locke. The second thing is it is unjust to break laws or others who believe it just to break bad laws. The third thing is that it is unjust for people to receive other than what they deserve. It is unjust to break a pact with someone it is unjust to be biased or partial. So what common thread or principle can we see here? Not, we can't find any really, obviously. Let me just reiterate, like it's wrong. To, it's unjust to take someone's property. It's unjust to break laws. It's unjust to receive other than what someone deserves. It's unjust to break a pact with someone. It's unjust to be biased or partial. And this not just Locke, but Hobbes as well lays all this stuff out pretty much like in pretty much these terms. But what is the unifying idea of justice that flows through these different prohibitions or these ideas about what is unjust? He doesn't think there's really anything that we can grab onto so neatly. So he turns to history instead and etymology of the term justice. So the history of the term justice. Originally in Greek, justice derives from just that refers to the manner of doing things but quickly transformed to refer to the prescribed manner of doing things. That is not just how one does something, but how it is prescribed, how it's told it should be done. So must also account for the term, like I'm gonna pronounce this right, recht, R-E-C-H-T, <laughs> that gave us the term right, recht. It was not always associated with law though, the idea of right and wrong has historically not been associated with law. I mean, laws haven't been written down for all of human history. Like in Athens, the first laws written down with Solon? Draco. Solon? Like four or five hundred years before Aristotle. So that's like almost three thousand years ago, a little less. And there's really so much to unpack here, like the history of 
right and wrong and justice being transformed into written laws and how there needed to be the introduction of new kinds of weights and measures to make that possible. And so like historically, people have been concerned about the question of law and justice, assuming that these things go hand in hand when we may have had ideas about justice long before there were laws. But our idea about it has been so influenced by the history of the circulation of money, especially in ancient Greece, uh, and the introduction of measures that can actually measure like what will make someone virtuous, how to actually account for debt. You know, these were actually some of the first laws were interested in determining like, how do you figure out what you owe someone or what someone owes you? And that is on display here where he says that the courts of justice administer the law almost as though they go hand in hand. Justice and its enactment through courts is synonymous with laws, which is really interesting because laws also need to be written down and we haven't always written stuff down. Writing is a pretty new invention in the entire history of human, in humanity's history. Writing is quite new. So putting aside religious prescriptions of law that apparently just come from God, he focuses purely on laws that have been created by humans. Now, in recognizing this, what he's essentially saying is that laws, there can be mistakes in laws. They can be valuable. You know, there can be problems with them because they're just created by humans. They aren't really created by God for Mill. And so we know that they can be flawed and it is justice's job to essentially adjudicate to figure out what laws should we should have to best adapt to changing circumstances where he says that then injustice, so non-justice or injustice, came to be attached not to all violations of law, but only to violations of such laws as ought to exist. So, and this is, you know, this is why courts have also been responsible for establishing laws through, uh, whatever the term is, you know, if there's a situation where uh, people go to court and they're like dealing with something they've never dealt with before. They will look at previous court cases and try to understand what to do. And then there will be some times when a new court case will shape the law, like Roe v. Wade in the U.S., for example, about access to abortion, how that court case actually made it legal for everyone in the U.S. to access abortion, which has been since overturned. But in that case, justice was working not just based off of what was written down in laws, but adapting to new circumstances, adapting to a new world, which we, <laughs> which the U.S. has now gone backwards on in all their brilliance and all their sexism. So law is limited compared to justice. Justice has the opportunity for Mill to say the law is not enough. We need something more. You know, we appeal to the world around us. We can say like, okay, these laws are not actually accounting for what's going on. And this, to, you know, harp on this point a little more, this is a big problem too with like big tech, where the tech sector with, for instance, like generative AI, like ChatGPT, it's changing so fast, so much faster than the law can actually keep up on. Like, I think the law is still trying to figure out Facebook. Like we're still trying to figure out what to do about that. It's just such a complicated arena. And so we have, to, we can't just appeal to law. Law is not synonymous with justice. So law is therefore limited compared to justice. Not all private affairs should be mandated by law, but we can expect people uh, will commit themselves to justice at all times. In his words, justice implies something that is not only right to do and wrong not to do, but which some individual person can claim from us as his moral right to claim that it is my moral right that people treat me justly which makes sense. But like, I mean, he's he kind of degrades back into the exact thing he critiques by just appealing to this term called justice and just being like, yeah, you know what I mean, right? But no, because we're just right back to the philosophers you were critiquing before who were trying to look for this abstract metaphysical thing called justice. We've just gone right back to square one here. And this is true of those Five examples above, like it is unjust to state, take someone's property, it's unjust to break a pact, yada, yada, yada. But he says he, that of those, that justice acknowledges someone may be punished who does harm and 
victimizes someone else. So he firmly believes that the just will to punish, the just will to punish, to hurt someone, uh, someone who inflicts harm, emerges from two of nature's properties. That is the impul impulse of self-defense and the feeling of sympathy. So we are guided, that is, we have a desire to punish people because we want to preserve ourselves. We want to make sure that preserve our self-defense. And when you have a social body that feels victimized by someone who committed a crime, then Mill thinks you are justified in harming them to protect that social body. And there's a whole, <laughs> so go check. I've done episodes on Foucault's Discipline and Punish. If you're interested in that, the entire history of punishment is eh, pretty interesting. Like how did people come to associate criminality with evil? Because actually for a long time, People associated criminality, or in some cases, associated criminality with virtue. For example, think of Robin Hood. Robin Hood is a classic example of somebody committing crimes who the majority view it as being a savior, as virtuous. So it's like, uh, Mill, yeah, okay, punish them, but what if, you know, they're actually good? But, yeah, <laughs> that's what he says. And... Our feelings of sympathy motivate us to protect people who have been victimized. So humans are different from animals for him in that they have intelligence and don't just operate on instinct. They can stand up for their uh, community or a stranger equally so. Now he says, our, our, you know, as he continues, our intelligence permits us to look at individual breaches of law in a broader context to judge them to find out like how severe is the, the breaking of the law, who is it affected, how badly were they affected, and so on. And not just respond in total chaos, like in a state of war. You know, according to him, we can take a step back as humans and be like, okay, what happened here? Who was affected? How badly? And what should be done about it? Now, again, this is to oppose everyone who says that, who thinks that all people at all times must be attuned to the law. He's like, justice is what extends beyond the law. Law is not good enough. And justice is inspired by an innate desire to attain a general happiness. Because we know as humans, we do better working with others, not against others. So a right, in the face of all this, a right is something society ought to defend me in the possession of. That is, I have a right to liberty, I have a right to property, I have a right to freedom of speech, and society must protect those rights. Now, obviously, though, there are problems here with all five examples, so long as we remain confined to the realm of justice, because the world and people are very complicated and precepts and laws vary. So those five examples from before, unjust to break a pact, unjust to take someone's property, yada, yada, yada. So for example, would it be, un would it be just to steal someone's car who's stolen my car? Or for the state to mandate the thief return another car of equal value to me after they've stolen mine? Some might say yes, some might say no. You know, it's ambiguous and Mill is leaving room for that to acknowledge this ambiguity. For Mill, an example like this reveals the uncertainty of justice in itself. People who claim it is natural or universal then, they're simply wrong. You know, he's leaving a lot of room to say that we're just looking after the greatest happiness and we're gonna make hiccups along the way, but we have to try and get there. Things that we can do mean like teaching people to equate their own happiness with the whole, creating institutions that privilege the happiness of the whole above the happiness of just individual tyrants or individual people just seeking money. So to solve this dilemma, we must appeal to social utility to determine what is right and what is wrong. And as we've seen, the greatest good comes from the right to be protected from harm, from right to do good, to do good and evil to evil. So on this point that we must do good to good and do evil against evil, He's guided by the idea that, you know, we qualify this uh, by saying that evil must have been voluntary 
and punishment should fit the crime. You know, evil cannot be a coincidence, like where, you know, if you're driving down the road and, I don't know, a lamp post falls on you that a woodpecker had chopped down or something. You, you can't blame the wood. I don't know, it's a silly example. You get what I'm saying? It, it has to be intentful. A woodpecker. Nice, David. Very good. So with time, justice's exercise has improved as people are seen more and more as equal by oppositions to slavery, racism, and sexism. Which, granted, yeah, okay, cool. Still a long way to go. But, you know, he's giving us what I think is a good template here. And these are things that we should always be mindful of and continually opposing to create the most equal world so that the most people can participate in general happiness. Now he concludes here by saying that justice is the appropriate name for certain social utilities which are vastly more important and therefore more absolute and imperative than any others. In general, but perhaps not in all cases, and is therefore distinguished from the milder feeling which attaches to the mere idea of promoting human pleasure. And that's it. That's how he concludes by reminding us that this doesn't have to do with just people feeling good in immediate bodily pleasure, but that it is that by utilitarianism, he's referring to an overall project geared towards arriving at the greatest general happiness for everyone and a sustained happiness at that. And yeah, that's pretty well lit. If you like what I did, you can like, you can share, you subscribe. If you listen to this on podcast, you can leave a review, tell your friends, who knows, they might get a kick out of it. Uh, but yeah, if, leave a comment if I got anything wrong or anything I didn't include here. I'd love to hear about it. And on that note, take care.